In this lesson, I just want to give a big picture overview of the core concepts or the core elements of almost all intentional torts. Here we say to establish a prima facie case for intentional torts, the plaintiff generally must prove the following three elements. We need a voluntary act by the defendant, intent, and number three, causation. These are typically our three core elements we're going to find baked into almost all intentional torts. We will see a few exceptions, right? When we're thinking about intent, very notably, when we get to intentional infliction of emotional distress, we'll see the rules kind of change a little bit in terms of intent. But for the most part, with all of our core intentional torts, we're going to go over battery, assault, false imprisonment, all of our property intentional torts, we're going to find that these really are the core elements that are baked into or the core features that are baked into all of our intentional torts. Again, we just want to keep in mind that intentional infliction of emotional distress will be a little bit different, but we'll cover that when we get to IIED or intentional infliction of emotional distress. But for the most part, right, these are our core elements. And another thing to note before we jump into these is if we're looking at a torts essay question and we're asked whether a person is liable for an intentional tort, take battery, you know, is Bobby liable for the intentional tort of battery? It's important to note that you don't have to discuss these elements separately from the elements of battery. Sometimes I see students do this because they see, oh, these are the you know, prima facie case elements for intentional torts. I'm gonna go through these three elements first, and then I'm going to discuss the actual elements of the intentional tort. This is not necessary, right? These concepts are all baked into the elements of our intentional torts. You know, the purpose of this lesson and talking about kind of the core features of all intentional torts is more so just to give you a mental framework to keep in mind as you work through your analysis. And as long as you're applying the elements correctly, you will be discussing these concepts as you work through the elements of the intentional tort. Basically, you don't need to go through these three things first and then go back over them as you go through the elements of the intentional tort. Just one note I like to make here. But with that, right, we can just jump into these elements and kind of break down these core features of almost all intentional torts. All right, so we can start with our first requirement. To establish a prima facie case for almost all intentional torts, the plaintiff generally must prove the following three elements. Number one, we need a voluntary act by the defendant. Here we say the act that gives rise to the defendant's liability must be based on a volitional bodily movement. Okay, so let's just start with an example here, right? Let's say that I'm walking down the street and out of nowhere, my buddies next to me say, we're just walking down the street and we're talking, we're having a conversation, my buddy and I. And let's say out of nowhere, I have an epileptic seizure, right? And I begin to start flailing, right? I fall over and I flail. And let's say as I flail, as I'm having this seizure, my arm flails and hits my buddy and it causes serious injury, right? My buddy gets hit in his face and he's got, you know, this big, you know, facial injury, maybe some eye injury, whatever, right? It causes harmful contact. When my hand foils and hits my buddy, you know, he sustains injury. In that fact pattern, am I going to be liable for the intentional tort of battery? Right When I'm having a seizure and my arm flails and it hits my buddy and then he sustains injury, am I liable for the intentional tort of battery? And we're gonna talk about the actual elements of battery. But for now, we can accept that a battery requires an act by the defendant which brings about harmful or offensive contact to the plaintiff's person. And harmful contact is going to be any contact that causes pain, disfigurement, or injury. So here, there's no question I've brought about harmful contact to the plaintiff, to my buddy, right? I flail my arm, 
hits my buddy, he's got injury, I mean, I have brought about harmful contact to my buddy, right? But why am I not going to be liable for the intentional tort of battery? The answer is that was not a voluntary act, right? The act that gives rise to my liability must be based on a volitional bodily movement. Here, when I'm having an epileptic episode and I'm seizing and my arms are flailing, right? those are all involuntary bodily movements. Those are not movements that are being dictated by my mind. Right? I have no control over that. It's just happening. right? So because those are involuntary bodily movements, the act that gave rise to my liability was involuntary. I am not going to be liable for the intentional tort of battery. Let's take another example. This is a classic that you'll see in torts, right? Let's say I'm on a train, okay? Trains move in 60 miles per hour, right? We're all, and say it's a really crowded train. We're in a packed cabin, right? And the train's going really fast. And out of nowhere, the train stops, right? It goes from 60 to zero in a few seconds, right? So, of course, I fly, right? I'm not holding on to anything, right? I'm not expecting the train to stop suddenly. And my body flies as the train stops and I hit the person next to me, right? My shoulder lunges into the person next to me. You know, again, I'm being flung by the train stopping and I hit somebody next to me and it causes injury. Again, will I be liable for the intentional tort of battery in that fact pattern? Remember, battery requires an act by the defendant which brings about harmful or offensive contact to the plaintiff's person. Well, again, I've brought about harmful contact, right? My body slams into the person next to me. It's causing them harmful contact. They have injury. So I have brought about harmful contact to the plaintiff's person What's the problem? Again, the act that brought about that contact was not based on a volitional bodily movement. I was thrown by the train, right? This isn't a movement that was dictated volitionally by my mind. This isn't voluntary. I didn't have the idea in my head to move my body to cause this contact. I got thrown, right? And that's what caused the contact. So again, that's involuntary bodily movement. Because it's involuntary, we can't satisfy the voluntary act requirement by the defendant. I'm not going to be liable for the intentional tort of battery. Let's take another example. Right? There's one area where this can get a little bit tricky. So let's say instead, let's change the fact pattern again. This time, let's say I'm walking down the street and I trip over a curb, right? Say I'm like approaching the sidewalk and I'm walking and I trip over the curb, right? And as I'm falling, right, I've tripped to brace my impact, I extend my arm, right? I'm falling over, I've tripped over the curb, I extend my arm to kind of brace for impact. It's very reflexive, right? A lot of people just do this out of reflex. As you're falling, you just kind of out of reflex, you extend your arm, right? Well, let's say as I do that, there's a person sitting there and I make contact with that person extending my arm and that contact results in injury. In that fact pattern, could I be held liable for the intentional tort of battery? starting with the voluntary act requirement. Is that type of bodily movement volitional? And here, courts actually say that that is dictated by the mind, right? Reflexes are different than seizures. They're different than being thrown by a train. When you do that, even for one split second, when you extend your arm, that's still being dictated by your mind. Even though it's reflexive, right? It's a reflex that you're having. It's still something the courts are going to say you're in control of. That's your mind making that decision, right? You're dictating your mind to send the electrical impulse to your muscle to extend the arm. In that case, we say it's volitional. So the easy way to remember this is reflexes, generally volitional, things like seizures, 
are going to be involuntary. And obviously, if someone's being thrown by something like a train or you get pushed by another person and you hit somebody but you were pushed, right? That's involuntary, right? If another force causes your movement, basically that's involuntary. Things like seizures are going to be involuntary. On the flip side, things like reflexes, as you fall, you extend your arm to brace yourself, that's actually a volitional bodily movement, okay? So that is our first prima facie case element for intentional torts. We need a voluntary act by the defendant, which takes us to our second core feature here, which is intent, right? Intentional torts, uh, we have to have intent, right? This is a requirement of intentional torts. And this is really what separates intentional torts from negligence and from strict liability causes of action. The intent requirement is really what separates when we're thinking about the big areas of tort law, right? We have intentional torts, we have negligence, and we kind of have strict liability causes of action. The thing that separates intentional torts into its own category is this second core feature, the intent requirement, right? This is really, you know, negligence we know a lot of times are based on accidents, right? It doesn't really matter what the person's intent was, whether they're well-intentioned, you know, bad intention, doesn't matter, right? If they're taking certain precautions or not taking certain precautions, right? That's really what we're more focused on. The actual intent subjectively in their brain is less important, right? We know when we get to negligence, we'll talk about it more, it's more of an objective standard. Whereas with intentional torts, it's a subjective, what was in their brain at the time the actions giving rise to liability occur. It's more of a subjective test of intent and that's what separates intentional torts into more of a subjective realm, more about what's in the person's head from something like negligence that's way more of an objective test. What would a reasonable person have done under like circumstances, right? Did they take the precautions a reasonable person would have under this you know, situation, under these circumstances, compared to something like an intentional tort where we're really asking, you know, what did this person believe in their mind as the actions giving rise to this fact pattern took place. Okay, so we can break this down though. And, and the best definition of intent to use is the second restatement of torts. This is what most courts are going to adhere to. So we'll just use the second restatement's definition. Under the second restatement of torts, section 8a, the definition of intent requires that the actor desires to cause consequences of his act or that he believes that the consequences are substantially certain to result from it. So under the second restatement, we kind of get two different methods, two different ways that we can satisfy the intent requirement for intentional torts. We get intent as desire, which you might hear referred to as specific intent, and we get intent as substantial certainty, which you might hear as general intent. So here we can start with specific intent or intent as desire first, okay? Intent as desire, specific intent, is satisfied if the, des if the defendant desired to cause consequences of his act. And in intentional torts, this becomes relevant if those desired consequences constitute an intentional tort. Okay, so the best way to think about this is number one, we have to establish that there was a voluntary act, that we have volitional bodily movements. Once we establish a person is voluntarily moving their body, right? 99.999% of the time when people are moving their body volitionally, they're doing it with some specific intent in mind, right? When you move around, when you move your body parts from A to B to C, you're doing so to accomplish objectives, right? You have desired consequences in mind, right? If you sit down to send an email, right? You sit down and you move your fingers, right? That's a volitional bodily movement. As you sit down to send an email, you're moving your fingers, 
right? You're sending the electrical impulses from your brain to the muscles and your arms and your wrists and then to your little fingers, your phalanges, right? To send off this email, right? That's all vo voluntarily, voluntary bodily movements, right? That's voluntary acts. And you're doing it with a specific intent in mind, right? As you're doing this, as you're moving your fingers, you have the intent to send an email. So this person can get information from you, whoever the recipient of the email is. You have the specific intent, right? The voluntary acts are being done with the specific intent to send an email. Okay, so you do have specific intent there, but you're not liable for an intentional tort when you send an email because the desired consequences, sending an email of your act, right, moving your fingers, do, does not constitute an intentional tort. Right? You're not bringing about any harm to any person, generally, if you're sending an email, right? So, that's the best place to kind of start with. Okay, number one, we do have a voluntary act, and we accept that most people, when they're engaged in voluntary acts, do so to accomplish some purpose, right? This is the specific intent. They have a desired consequence in mind. That's why you're moving your body, right? You want to accomplish some desired consequences. So most actions we're taking, we have some specific intent in mind. And most of the time, that doesn't matter in intentional torts, but it becomes relevant when those desired consequences a person has constitutes basically the elements of an intentional tort. Okay, so let's draw out a fact pattern and kind of build on this fact pattern. And at each layer, we'll kind of distinguish what is specific intent and what isn't. So let's start with something very basic, right? Say I have this dry erase marker. This will be easy to illustrate just using the dry erase marker. Let's say that I take my dry erase marker and you know I hold it up like this and I'm, I'm holding it like this and I release my fingers, right? So I engage in a voluntary bodily movement. I'm not having a seizure or something like that. I am, my movement of my fingers is being dictated by my mind. So it's a volitional bodily movement. And let's say I release my fingers so that the dry erase marker will drop and hit the ground, right? That's just, that's my specific intent here. My desired consequence is to release the dry erase marker from my fingers to have it hit the ground, right? To illustrate a point in this lesson, right? At that point, if I actually do it, say I take the dry erase marker and I drop it, right? Dry erase marker hits the ground. At this point, have I committed some sort of intentional tort? Could I be held liable for an intentional tort? And we all know the obvious answer is no, of course not. I haven't harmed anyone, right? I had the desired consequence, I had the desired consequence of a marker hitting the ground, right? So I did have specific intent, right? I had a voluntary act releasing my fingers and I had the specific intent for a dry erase marker to hit the ground. Right, but that's not a problem. It's not relevant because my desired consequence of the dried race marker hitting the ground does not constitute an intentional tort. Okay, let's change this a little bit. Let's add something to the fact pattern and make it more interesting. Same thing. Let's say I do the exact same thing. I take my hand up like this. I release my fingers, right? This movement being dictated by my mind. So my act is volitional, right? And I drop the dry erase marker, right? I drop it, same thing, it hits the ground. But this time, the dry erase marker hits the ground and it bounces, right? Let's say it ricochets off the ground and it hits somebody in the eye, right? And this person now goes blind, right? Dry erase marker hits the ground, it bounces up and it hits somebody in the eye. And this person now has pain, disfigurement, injury, and they're blind for life, right? Would I be liable in that fact pattern for the intentional tort of battery, okay? Well, again, we know the voluntary act requirement is satisfied. I, the movement was dictated by my mind, right? Releasing the dry, the dry erase marker, right? When I do this with my fingers, right? That's the voluntary act. Okay, so that's requirement. That requirement is satisfied, 
right? Did I have specific intent here, right? Could that be satisfied for battery, right? Well, remember, intent is satisfied if the defendant desires to cause consequences of his act. Well, my desired consequences subjectively, honestly, in my head was to illustrate a point, was just for this dry erase marker to hit the ground and stop. Right? I didn't want to bounce up and hit anyone or cause harm. My goal was for the dry erase marker to hit the ground. Okay, That was what my desired consequence was. So the analysis actually doesn't change. Even though we had this crazy thing, it bounces and it hits somebody and now they're injured for life, my intent was the exact same in both fact patterns. So again, I'm not liable for the intentional tort of battery under a specific intent analysis because my subjective and my honest head desired consequence of my act was just for the dry erase marker to hit the ground and not cause any contact with any human being. So there, my desired consequences did not constitute an intentional tort so I didn't have the specific intent necessary to be held liable for the intentional tort of battery. Okay? Let's change it again. Okay? Same thing. I raised my hand up like this. I got the dry erase marker. But this time, let's say there's a student who is watching me give this lecture and they've fallen asleep, right? And they're on the ground below me. And I'm annoyed, right, that the student's asleep, so I want to wake him up. So I'm going to do the exact same thing, right? I'm going to put the dry erase marker. I'm going to release the dry erase marker. And let's say subjectively my intent in my brain when I release the dry erase marker is to cause this student a momentary second of pain, right? I want to cause them just a little sting on their shoulder. I want to drop it maybe on their chest, their shoulder. Give them a little sting, right, so that they wake up. Enough little pain to wake them up and make a little point. All right, so say I do it again. I take the dry erase marker up. I, you know, the movement is dictated by my mind, right? It's volitional. I release my fingers like this. The dry erase marker again drops and it hits the student's shoulder exactly as I intended. But let's say it bounces. Again, this time it bounces up and it hits the student in the eye, right? And the student is now blind for life. They have disfigurement, pain, injury. They're blind for life, okay? Am I liable for the intentional tort of battery there, right? Do I have the specific intent required to be liable for the intentional tort of battery? Well, again, the voluntary act requirement is satisfied. We know that the movement of my fingers to release the dry erase marker was dictated in my mind, right? That's a voluntary bodily movement. I'm not having a seizure or anything like that. It's a voluntary bodily movement. It's a voluntary act by me, the defendant. Next question, did I have the specific intent, basically, to bring about harmful or offensive contact to this plaintiff? Right, because that's what a battery is. Intentional tort of battery is an act that brings about an act by the defendant which brings about harmful or offensive contact to the plaintiff's person. Okay, so did I have the specific intent to bring about harmful or offensive contact? And the answer is remember, this is why I said I intended in my brain to cause a momentary second of pain. Right? So when I said that, basically analysis is over. When the defendant confesses subjectively in their head that they had the intent to bring about harmful contact, the intent analysis is over. Okay, well you did desire to cause this consequence that does constitute an intentional tort. So what actually happens, the extent of the injury doesn't matter. As long as the defendant's desired consequences constitutes an intentional tort, then they have the specific intent. We don't care about the extent of the injury and whether the defendant desired this particular consequence. That's all irrelevant. And that's where students get tripped up a lot of the time in these analyses, right? A lot of times students will say, well, look, he didn't have the intent to injure this student, right? His intent was just to you know, cause a momentary second of pain, right? To wake him up. He didn't want to blind the kid for life. So he didn't have the specific intent required for this battery. And that's an incorrect analysis. 
We don't care whether the defendant intended this particular consequence or intended this specific degree of harm. We only care that the defendant's desired consequence constitutes the elements of an intentional tort, right? The intent is satisfied if the defendant desires to cause consequences of his voluntary bodily movement and those desired consequences constitute an intentional tort. So in that fact pattern where I have the desire to bring about pain to the student for one second by hitting him with the dry erase marker, that's enough. That's battery. That's me desiring to bring about harmful contact to this student. Even though I didn't mean to permanently injure this student, that doesn't matter, right? I'm still liable, at least in terms of specific intent, I'm still liable. I have the specific intent necessary to be held liable for the intentional tort of battery. Okay, so that's specific intent. Now we can move on to general intent right, or intent as a substantial certainty, kind of the second part. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata videos. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else. Um, in any of the other online resources that i found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.